absolute undiluted hell. The last few hours for David Jenkins have consisted of nothing but pain and disbelief. An anonymous email message said that his beloved wife of six years, Lauren, had been seen entering a room at a cheap motel the previous Wednesday afternoon, and that she was now having lunch with the same man again. To say that David was shocked would be a gross understatement. He and Lauren were deeply in love, and their lovemaking was usually intense and sincere. He was not yet 30, and he thought that their lovemaking was energetic and enjoyable for each of them. However, he couldn't ignore the email or its consequences. So, feeling as tense and stressed as he had never been in his life, he drove home that day a changed man. Arriving home around 6 p.m. as usual, he saw Lauren's car already in the driveway. Still in her work clothes, she was standing at the sink rinsing vegetables when he entered the kitchen, hesitantly greeted her, and put down his briefcase. Hi, honey, how was your day? Lauren wiped her hands on a towel before turning to kiss him. David was amazed at how careless Lauren was after spending the day with another man. Great, but this afternoon there was some bad news related to a project we're working on, and it looks like I'm going to have to go to Greensboro on Friday, so I won't be home until 8 p.m., depending on how the meetings go, and then I'll just go home. David knew Lauren's work schedule pretty well, and he knew that schedule was most flexible on Wednesday and Friday afternoons. So his first thought on how to verify the allegations in this email was to make it even easier for Lauren on the upcoming Friday. The crisis of the project, the meeting, and the business trip were all lies, and instead he arranged to take a vacation on Friday and do some preliminary work, as well as look after the motel for Lauren and her lover. Well, at least you don't have to stay the night and we'll spend the whole weekend together anyway, Lauren offered. Since you really can't predict when you'll be back home, could you call me when you leave Greensboro? I'll do my best to prepare for dinner. David thought for a moment. Yesterday, he wouldn't have noticed or even thought how attentive Lauren was, trying to make dinner possible together, despite his unplanned business trip. Now he wondered if she had asked him to give her a two-hour period to cover her feet and remove her lover's footprints. Of course, I'll call you when I have a better idea of when I can leave Greensboro, and I'll also call you from the road when I figure out what time I'll be home. Is it okay? Since the point of Friday now was to make it easier for Lauren to cheat again, if it really was her at the motel, and if this email was accurate, David wanted Lauren to feel comfortable knowing that he wouldn't have a chance to catch her. David, I'm going to cook dinner and then I'm going to take a quick shower. Could you keep an eye on this frying pan while I'm gone? Make sure the vegetables don't burn. Lauren said, grabbing her purse and carrying it upstairs. Sure, honey, don't worry, David replied. Meanwhile, thinking to himself, it's weird, I thought she usually left her purse downstairs. The shower itself also made him think. Although it wasn't uncommon, she usually didn't shower immediately upon returning home. So as he looked through the mail and stirred the vegetables, he nervously wondered if the accidental shower was related to the news in the email he had received earlier. To hell with my life, David thought. One anonymous email, and I'm questioning everything in my marriage that, until today, I thought was absolutely wonderful. David was clearly thoughtful at dinner. Is there anything else wrong, honey, besides the project you were talking about? You seem awfully quiet and almost on another planet, Lauren finally asked, getting a succinct answer to a couple of questions she was asking. No, I'm sorry. I guess I'm just tired, and I'm already thinking about what I need to do tomorrow to be ready to go to Greensboro on Friday. David understood that he needed to behave normally so as not to make Lauren think that something was unusual. It seemed almost funny to David. What should be considered ordinary now? My wife may cheat on me, or I may be taunted by someone with a crappy sense of humor, or I may become the unintended victim of an incorrect email address. What if it was a completely different woman, and the sender mistook her for my wife? To hell with such a life. Yesterday I was sure of my happiness, and today I'm a fucking wreck of doubt. Dinner was cleaned up, and after watching some TV, David and Lauren talked about plans for the weekend and eventually began to get ready for bed. David has already said that he goes to bed early because he had to go to work early to prepare for the trip. David's stomach nodded at the thought of what he would do if Lauren took any steps about cheating tonight. He thought about Wednesday evenings and whether there had been any pattern in her cheating lately and realized with horror that, according to his memories, it was about 50. 50. Linking it to her shower after work, he felt like he was in the dark, trying to pinch the tail of a two-faced donkey. Lauren got into bed first, and when David joined her, she quickly snuggled up to him from behind, 
hugged him tightly, and reached out to scratch his chest with her nails. Can I take you away from work for 30 minutes, my love? Lauren offered playfully. Shit, David thought. How much more can I take before I lose my temper? He patiently stuck to the plan and said, As much as I'd like to, darling, I'm not going to do you much good today or tomorrow. I'm just too distracted by this project looming over me. As he said this, he again couldn't believe how much his life had changed in the 60 seconds it took to read and understand this simple email that he had received just 10 hours ago. It's all right, darling, I understand. I just thought that if you're ready for this, I'd offer you some well-deserved stress relief. Lauren hugged David tightly and kissed him on the back of the head before saying goodnight and rolling over. David was relieved, and at the same time, what did she mean by, if you're ready for it? To hell with my life. David got up and left for work before Lauren woke up, so he dodged further questions or insightful glances. He realized how badly he was coping with a problem, real or imagined. Last night reminded him of the traitorous heart, and realizing this, he realized that he had to avoid another night of close contact with Lauren. Hi, honey. I'm going to work late tonight getting ready for tomorrow's trip and meetings, so don't worry about dinner for me and I'll see you probably before bedtime. David left in her voicemail around noon. However, Thursday was spent without preparation for business meetings. David was a planner and organizer by nature and by profession, so although he didn't have irrefutable facts of her infidelity, he wanted to organize everything. He called everyone in a row until he found a lawyer who could meet with him the next day and searched the internet for recording devices. Deciding what he wanted to buy, he searched the city for some local stores with similar devices and found a store where he would stop before heading home. David is competent enough in his real job that no one would ask him what was going on, but his heart and mind were clearly somewhere else. He was a little late from work and then went into a store with eavesdropping equipment and bought a simple voice-activated pen, which he thought he could hide in Lauren's purse, which was usually with her in her office and in the car. He also brought work home to pretend to be preparing for a trip the next day until Lauren went to bed. Hi, honey, I'm so glad you're finally home, Lauren said, walking to the door when David arrived around 9 p.m. How is the project and the trip going? I think it's not bad. Since we have learned about these new issues, we have allocated more resources to this, so I hope that everything will be resolved on Friday, for better or for worse. This is playing with fire. David mused, for better or for worse. I wonder if she feels the same way now. Thursday night, to David's relief, was a repeat of the previous night with only hugs. To her credit, Lauren seemed completely unperturbed, and as far as David could tell, behaved towards him the same way as before. Relatively speaking, however, he was such a complete wreck that it probably wasn't hard for Lauren to seem normal compared to David. On Friday, getting up again at dawn, David checked the pen, put it in Lauren's purse, and left the house. He spent some time in a coffee shop and then went to meet with a lawyer at 10 a.m. David considered this meeting solely for information, but in the end he liked the lawyer very much. They discussed David's email and his so far unconfirmed fears, as well as the fact that today was a date with a potential lover, which David was going to check out himself. He admitted that he had nothing but that damn email, so going all in on a private investigator or thousands of dollars of electronic surveillance equipment didn't make much sense. From the lawyer, David learned about the formulaic reality of divorce, for that matter. Without children, a no-fault divorce was relatively straightforward, especially since David and Lauren received comparable salaries and had similar retirement plan balances. The house was mostly in debt, so its liquidation would have been more of an emotional shock than a financial strain. However, David left the law office in complete confusion. How can I even feel this nightmare and think that it's not going to be that bad? We were supposed to be together forever, until death do us part. David spent lunchtime at a coffee shop, surfing the internet, and continuing to study the procedure of what is called divorce. Websites are full of information on how to detect a cheating spouse, as well as how to avoid detection when cheating, how to hide income, and how to find it. The most instructive sites were dedicated to why spouses cheat. Nothing David had read had struck a chord with Lauren's motivation. That fact alone was probably the reason David hoped deep down that it was all a mistake. Lauren couldn't cheat on him. They were too close, too much in love, too in sync with each other for that to be true. When he couldn't talk about cheating anymore, he packed up and left, heading to the motel. Time passed slowly, or so it seemed to David. 
As he drove to the motel mentioned in that damn email, he realized that if the whole affair story was really true, then it was possible that Lauren didn't always use the same motel. If that were true, then today's whole day might have been in vain, and he still wouldn't have learned anything for sure. The pen he put in her purse might eventually bear some fruit, but David knew he couldn't take this uncertainty about the state and future of his marriage anymore. Entering the motel parking lot at 1.40 p.m., he drove around until he found a remote parking spot that overlooked most of the rooms in the office. Now he just has to wait. There weren't many people going in and out of the motel, so when the man parked the latest model Acura, visited the office, and then entered the room on the ground floor, he seemed vaguely familiar to David. The name didn't come to mind, but it seemed to David that he had seen this man before. All of David's doubts ended, as did his hopes, about five minutes later, when Lauren's Honda Accord parked next to the Acura, and she jumped out with her purse in her hand, went to the door of the same room, and knocked quickly. A few seconds later, the man opened the door, and Lauren walked inside with her usual ease and confidence. To hell with my life, it's all true, David thought, pounding on the steering wheel with his fists. How could Lauren do this to us? And why? It just didn't make any sense or reason. David had never felt so blind in his life. The planner and the organizer have just pulled the carpet out from under it. David's thoughts raced left, right, up and down like a roller coaster, and he suddenly realized that he was now sharing a crumbling share in a marriage in complete and terrible crisis. Knowing that today was at least Lauren's second case of cheating, and that she was dodging work to do it, made David feel like there was nothing more to be gained by hanging out at the motel. He wasn't going to confront them by knocking on the door. It could get unpleasant, and he needed time and space to calm down and prepare for any of his next steps. His disbelief up to this point had left him woefully unprepared emotionally for the next steps. Then he remembered the pen he'd put in her purse and grimaced bitterly. Real-time audio, he thought painfully. It's just great. He had the presence of mind to take a few photos of the two cars parked side by side in front of their love nest, and he took a close-up of the man's car, which had a license plate on it, before slowly turning to the exit and returning to the road. He didn't have a destination in mind, but for a while he just drove aimlessly until he almost ran a red light and was almost hit. This one shocked him, so he stopped at a beer brewery and drank a beer, trying to collect his thoughts. At first, he thought he had just moved from idle suspicion to full awareness, but realized how little he knew at the moment, and he had no idea who this guy was, how long it had been going on, and more importantly, why. As far as he knew, for more than seven years, he and Lauren had been exclusive, engaged, and then married. He had enough evidence to resist, but it wasn't enough to know if what Lauren would answer would be true. As much as it hurt him to listen to the tape of today's afternoon date, he knew he had to wait to get a pen out of her purse before he said anything to Lauren. He also knew that he wouldn't be able to be around the lovesick Lauren if she was in the mood to make love to him later, after his supposed business trip. He had been pushing her away this week, referring to the trip, so his ready-made excuse would disappear, and further abandoning love with Lauren would most likely increase her awareness that something was going wrong. So what should I do? I need this pen then I need to quickly confirm that there is something on it, and then I could leave the house and stay for a few days to figure out where I am in all this shit, David sketched in his mind. With this overall plan in mind, David had an insidious thought. She thinks that I will arrive later than usual tonight, so that I can shake her and my lover. I need to call with the news that I'm almost home. After finishing his beer and paying the bill, he pulled the car back onto the road and dialed Lauren's cell phone number. He wrote a voice message. Hello, dear, great news. The preparatory work has borne great fruit, and everyone has done a great job to get everything back on track, so I'm about 30 minutes from Charlotte and the traffic isn't that bad. I have to be home at about the usual time. I hope this scares her to death, you fucking bum, David said aloud to himself. He headed home, and upon arrival, he quickly packed a couple of bags and put them in the trunk of his car. Then he sat down and wrote a note to Lauren. Depending on how the night went, he wanted to be able to just escape without much confrontation. He didn't know what was on the tape, so he didn't want a full-scale confrontation yet. Part of his reasoning was also the desire to dumbfound her to the same extent that she had dumbfounded him. When David called Lauren, she and her lover Rob were in the final throes of their second copulation that day. Today was their last day together, and thanks to the extra runway provided by David's trip, they made the second lap for the first time.
They also saw it as a celebration or a victory dance. But now it seemed like a potentially careless move. Listening to the voicemail message, she muttered, Shit, I need to move, Rob. It was David who said he was already on his way back and would be home around 6 p.m. as usual. Well, at least you got the early warning phone call he promised you, Rob joked back as Lauren hugged him and said goodbye, then quickly ran to the bathroom to take a shower. Routine and habits took over. Rob got dressed and left the room while Lauren took a shower. He was heading to the gym for his standard workout after intercourse and showering. On the way home, Lauren was more worried about David's early return home and his joyful mood that the project was changing for the better. I thought he'd be home late and probably burned out from meetings and trips, but he'll probably want to make love tonight after missing most of the week, she thought, turning into their neighborhood. Still a little nervous, she turned the corner, approached her house, and saw David's car already parked in the driveway. Holy shit, he did well in Friday's traffic she muttered aloud as she parked her Accord next to his new civilian. Lauren thought he might want to pounce on her as soon as she was gone. She thought that perhaps a proactive suggestion of a nice holiday dinner might be a good idea. David was on tenterhooks when he heard Lauren's car in the driveway. This would be the first time he would see her since he knew for sure that she was a liar. The bags were packed and in the car. The note was prepared. All he needed was a pen to write. He was sitting in the living room to catch Lauren as soon as she arrived. Hi, honey, Lauren exclaimed as she entered and saw David getting up from his chair. It looks like everything went well. Why don't we go out to eat and celebrate? What is it? She asked him as they hugged and kissed each other. That sounds great since I got home early. Why don't you go upstairs and change your clothes while I book a table somewhere? David suggested. Lauren readily agreed and threw her work bag and purse on the table and then went up the stairs to the master bedroom. David waited until he heard the shower start, then went to her purse and took out a pen. He pressed rewind and then play, heard the beginning of the lover's conversation and quickly turned off the knob. Well, that settles it. It's time to get out of here. And David took out his note for Lauren and left it on the table next to her bags. Pausing in the doorway, David looked back at their house, sadly realizing that nothing would ever be the same between him and her. Lauren dressed quickly, coming downstairs with her ponytail still wet. She suggested that he might be hungry after the trip, and also probably wants to make love later. Not seeing him in the living room, she went to the kitchen and saw a note lying on the table. Picking it up and starting to read, she gasped, No, God, no, this can't be happening. Lauren, I know about your lover and your affair. I couldn't believe it was true. But your afternoon date at the motel dispelled all doubts. You've crushed my soul, and I'm so sad and angry that I can't be with you right now. I'll be gone for a night or two while I try to collect my thoughts, and then I'll call you to arrange a time for our conversation. Don't try to contact me or find me. Trust me when I say I shouldn't see you until I'm ready. David. David left the house and drove to the hotel. After checking into his room, he had dinner downstairs, ordered a double scotch on the rocks, and then reluctantly returned to the room to listen to a recording of Lauren's betrayal of their marriage vows during the day. Settling into an armchair by his desk, he turned on the dictaphone and heard the next sound as soon as Lauren entered the room. Lauren, hi Rob, I can't believe we've already finished this case, both by appointment and by time. I did not think that we would have at least five meetings so easily, and even within 30 days. Rob, hi Lauren, yes, I thought it would take longer. We spent much more time planning and preparing than executing. I suppose this is the result of good planning, right? Lauren, I suppose. I have to say I'm glad it's over. The stress of hiding our affair affects me, and I understand why long-term affairs usually lead to a disastrous outcome. Rob. Yes, it's the same here. I know my wife has no idea, but I can see how it can easily stop over time. You said David would be out of town until late at night, right? I was thinking that we could have a drink together today to celebrate our success and finish, so to speak, with a bang. Lauren. Haha, -ha, that was pretty lame, Rob. I'm kind of in favor, but rules are rules, so we're not doing anything new that wasn't on the list. Lauren and Rob undressed, and David heard kisses and gentle moans coming from Lauren. Then David heard the bed creak. David listened to the entire 90 minutes of love between Lauren and Rob. Two things struck him. First, the business in bed seemed normal, even ordinary, and David couldn't imagine why Lauren would risk her marriage for the same thing. Rob used condoms during intercourse and nothing they did was outlandishly erotic. 
and secondly, none of them humiliated or defamed their spouses at all. David knew that the affair was real. They had met five times, but he still had no idea why, what was behind it. Friday night was mostly sleepless for both David and Lauren. In the end, David gave up and realized that there was nothing more to extract from the recording. Deciding to take advantage of the weekend and the freedom from work, he wrote to Lauren, I'll stop by your house at 11 a.m. to talk, if that's okay with you. Lauren grabbed her phone when she heard the ping of an incoming message. Yes, please come home. I'm so sorry that I hurt you. David ignored Lauren's reply. Arriving shortly before 11 a.m., David dragged himself to the front door and rang the doorbell. Lauren opened the door. David, you don't have to call your own house. I didn't feel comfortable just walking in, David replied. Can we sit down at the kitchen table and discuss the next steps? Lauren was unhappy with David's businesslike behavior and the way this discussion was developing. Sitting across the table from each other, time stood still for a moment, and then David cleared his throat and asked a question that shocked Lauren to the core. Do you deny in any meaningful way the facts that I found out about your activities with Rob? Lauren shed tears and thought about David's question and how focused and businesslike he was. This conversation, in her opinion, should have been aimed at making David understand that nothing she had done had changed her feelings for him, and that she and Rob had this affair only to prove their work colleagues wrong. David only knew about the senseless love in bed, and nothing about Lauren's conversations at work, which led to Rob and Lauren's plan to prove their friends wrong. David, before we go any further, you must first understand that Rob and I only did this to prove that we could have an affair, and no one would know about it. A few months ago, many of us at work discussed affairs and how they are almost always discovered, as well as the tragic upheavals they cause in marriages. The discussion was divided into two camps. Some thought that all cases beyond a one-night stand would certainly be solved. Others thought that keeping something more than a one-night stand secret would require some planning and, of course, a fair amount of deception, but it could be done. Rob and I got to the last camp, and then we talked about what precautions would be needed. Wait a second. Are you saying it was just an experiment or a game? Just to see if you can have an affair that would go unnoticed? Yes, in fact, that's all. It's just that talking about it has turned into a game. The hypotheses that we outlined over several dinners just took on a life of their own. And in the end, we outlined everything in some detail, and we made sure that we could make it happen. But that was the catch. To truly succeed, it would mean that not a single soul can and will never know what we have achieved. In short, we decided to test our plan, fully realizing that Rob loved his wife as much as I love you, and that this game, if you will, meant nothing when it came to our relationship. It was just a bet affair, and one of our conditions for the test was that it had to last at least 30 days, and we had to meet at least five times. But it was just a bed, David. We don't love each other at all. We love our spouses. We purposefully didn't do anything sexual that we didn't share with our partners, and it never took anything away from our spouses. What do you mean they didn't take anything away from me? I used to have a faithful wife, but now she's gone. Yes, I suppose that's true now that you know. But if you had never found out about it, you would have believed that I was faithful. And throughout this month, if you wanted love after Rob and I were together, I never turned you down. Great, Lauren. Sloppy seconds. And no harm has been done. Now I feel really warm and fluffy. Look, I know you're hurting. And you must feel terrible about what you heard. And I'm truly sorry that I hurt you. But I hope that the details I've shared can dispel any doubts about my love for you and erase all thoughts of my feelings for Rob. He's just a colleague I had a bed with, but that's it. No love, no feelings. It's only because you know it's a terrible thing right now. Rob and we were very careful, and we were sure that we would never be discovered, and we would never have thought that it would cause any harm to our marriages. Okay, so it's a long story to basically admit that you cheated on me for a month, made love to a man who is not your husband about five times, and fully intended to keep this affair a secret from me, your husband, for the rest of our life together. Returning to my main question, I assume you don't deny any of the disgusting facts that I've learned about your activities with Rob? Lauren wilted a little at the repeated direct attack on her excuses. Yes, I suppose the facts are what they are, but the reasons for them should matter. There was no lust between us, to prove that we can hide the affair. David was torn between thinking that Lauren must have swallowed a bottle of stupid pills last month and wondering if she always held such crazy beliefs. 
I really believe in this subtle piece of your shit. It doesn't seem like there's much passion between the two of you. That's right, David. There was no passion. I know it hurts you, but I'm willing to do anything to make it up to you. Wait, it's still bullshit. The whole, it was just a game in bed excuse is nonsense, and you should know it very well. We talked about being faithful when we decided to be exceptional. We discussed this in detail when we talked about marriage. We had been dating exclusively for almost a year, and we talked again before I proposed. We specifically promised fidelity to each other during the pre-wedding counseling and in our damn wedding vows. I don't recall a single mention of escape. Lauren saw that it was pointless to argue with their story. David, you're right. We did discuss fidelity in detail. The point I'm trying to make is that we're on the same page where it matters, bearing in mind our love for each other. I've only loved you for the last seven plus years, and I haven't had the slightest feelings for Rob for a second. If playing with Rob five times in a month could make a difference, then that's what we would do. It was more like the stupid pills were to blame, and then David jumped at what Lauren had just said. So why didn't you just play yachting? Or should you have just played backgammon? Or just do some other damn thing besides bed? You made it clear that you didn't have to make love to Rob, and you also said that no other soul would ever know about this affair, so you could do something else in that hotel room and it would look and smell like a romance. Mission accomplished, right? To prove that you are capable of having an affair, you didn't really need to make love. You still had to hide your activities from your spouses, so there was some blame for that. You were leaving work early anyway, so you'd have to hide it anyway. It really doesn't matter if you're in bed with or without love. Lauren's head tilted to the side as she considered David's challenge, and she felt herself sinking fast and deep. Lauren couldn't think of any other excuses to overcome his assumption. Since no one would ever know, it didn't really matter if Rob and Lauren made love or not. To win their little unannounced bet, they just had to act out an affair with all the necessary secrets and meetings in hotels. So why was she actually making love? I do not know, David. I've never thought about this aspect of secrecy. We were planning a secret affair to see if we could do it. Then we decided to check out our plan. We were just supposed to go all the way to the end. Lauren, all day today you've been using the word just to minimize what you've done. Just like saying just a second or just a little bit, when in fact what you've done is causing serious damage. And that's the worst thing that one of the we could have been done with our marriage. The fact that you can't see it for yourself is probably worse than sleeping in bed with another man five times in a month. Damn, you almost feel like you've only made love to him five times, so it's okay. Well, it's very important to me and we're not getting anywhere at the moment, so I'm leaving for now. David left after returning to the hotel. On Monday, he canceled work and began to think about Lauren's arguments. He couldn't believe that she thought so little about her loyalty that she threw it aside to win a ghostly bet against work colleagues who knew nothing. It's all a game to her. I've had enough, David thought to himself. I could sit here, suffer, and try to find some explanation for her actions, but there is none. It was a betrayal of her obligations to him, her precious vows to keep those obligations to him forever, until death do us part. What ultimately struck David the most was that no matter how terrible his final decision was, he felt surprisingly at ease with it. He felt better than he had ever felt since he received that damn email. Without losing hope, Lauren readily agreed to another meeting the next day. What is it? Lauren asked, quickly flipping through a stack of papers. It's just a divorce, David replied.